All righty, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to the regular board meeting of the San Benito CISD Board of Trustees. Today is Tuesday, April 12th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. It is 531. Okay, I begin with roll call. Ms. Janie Lopez. Present. Mr. Oscar Medrano. Present. Mr. Rudy Corona. Present. Dr. Ariel Cruz. Present. Mr. Orlando Lopez. Mr. Mario Silva. Present. Ms. Teresa Cervellon. Present. Mr. Stephen Weller. Present. And I am here, we do have a quorum. So that said, we move on to item 1.2, Pledge of Allegiance to the United States and the Texas flags and our invocation. Leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance is Sergio Naranjo from v Veterans Memorial Academy. Sergio Naranjo is 14 years old and currently attends San Benito Veterans Memorial Academy. He is the son of Rocio Garcia and Sergio Naranjo. His favorite subject is school biology. Sergio is a freshman class student council president. What he enjoys more than anything else is spending quality time with his two-year-old twin little sisters. Sergio has a very, very amicable personality, so socializing with his fellow peers and making new friends come easily to him. Sergio is confident he will achieve becoming an FFA officer while also being part of the San Benito football and soccer teams. His long-term goals are to join the United States Marine Corps after high school and soon after go to college and become a dentist. Linus in the invocation is also from Veteran Memorial Academy is Stephanie Muniz. Stephanie Muniz is a 15 years old and attends SB Veterans Memorial Academy. She is the daughter of Alex and Juani Muniz. Stephanie is very involved with her church youth group and enjoys helping the group every Friday. She also loves spending her free time hanging out with her friends and family. Stephanie is a freshman class president, council vice president. After high school, Stephanie plans on attending the University of Texas at San Antonio to become a teacher. Her hobbies include powerlifting, baking, and walking her neighbor's dog. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Please remain standing for the invocation. Please bow your heads. Dear God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here gathered once again. Thank you for the gift of education. We ask that you bless the students, faculty, and leaders that make our school district a great place. Please give our faculty and leaders wisdom to guide us students towards success. I pray that you keep us safe and protect us from any harm. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'd like to recognize you with a little token of our appreciation. Also recognizing the parents, we, we give a round of applause to the parents of these students, fine students. And, and pr Principal Gilbert Galvan. Thank you, Principal. Thank you. 
The next item on our agenda is public comment. So just a reminder. Before we begin, I will remind our audience members of the board's procedures for handling public comment. The public comment portion of our meeting is available to members of the public who wish to address any topic. Anyone who would like to speak during public comment must sign in prior to the start of the meeting and list the topics they want to discuss. Each public comment speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to address the board for each topic. If more than 10 speakers are signed up to speak on the same topic, all additional speakers on that item shall be limited to two minutes. However, any public testimony speaker who requires a translator will receive up to six minutes to address the board. Please keep your comments or criticism civil and courteous. Please avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others during your opportunity to speak. Lastly, we ask that you do not discuss students who are not your own children. If a speaker is seeking board resolution of a specific complaint, that concern should be addressed through the district's grievance process. District policy DGBA has been established for addressing employee complaints. Policy FNG is the avenue for filing parent complaints. And policy GF addresses community member complaints. Grievance forms may be obtained at any campus administration office or at the district's central administration offices. Thank you. Our first speaker is Ms. Mary Maney. Ms. Maney, welcome. I, what I wanted to speak on tonight was referring back to the naming of the portable for uh, Chief Richard Wilson. Um, I am a military dependent. I was raised in the Navy. I've gone through ROTC. I've had very strong feelings about military all the way. So recognizing someone like this is very important, especially since we do have such a strong NJROTC unit here. And if you aren't really considering naming the building itself, it would be really nice if we had a Chief Richard Wilson Memorial shooting range, because not only are they going to use it for air rifles, but my STEMS group is going to be using it for archery also, so uh, making it a multi-purpose, and I do think that would be a very beneficial thing because we go to places and these pla places have names attached to them, not just oh you're going over to the range, you know. So it would be a good honor for uh, Chief Williams. It would be a way to keep him in the memory of it and to recognize the fact that NJROTC is one of the driving forces behind us being able to get this, particularly if we can bring up not just our air rifle, but in our archery and bring that up, up to maybe even the national level. So to give our whole school more recognition. Uh, so thank you very much for that and I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Joanna Bryant, MD. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name's Joanna Chen Bryant. Um, you know the saying, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could? That's me. <clears throat> I love Texas. Um, just a little bit about my background. I, I have a BS in biochemistry from Florida State University. I, I did three years of research at Duke University in the neuromuscular um, uh, neurosciences department. I got my uh, MD from Wake Forest University. I am an emergency medicine uh, board certified physician and my residency was at Cook County Hospital. <clears throat> I worked um, for a number of years in Chicago and Southern California as an ER doctor and I also was a civilian contractor at the Naval Hospital in Camp Pendleton right before we moved here. Near the end of my uh, medical career, I met my husband and we had two kids and I started my second career as a stay-at-home homeschooling mother and I am currently a director for the eighth grade level of my classical conversations um, homeschool group and we meet together once a week uh, for six and a half hours where we study uh, logic, Latin, um, writing, creative writing, you know, all sorts of uh, 
chemistry, everything under the sun. Um, so that's my background. <clears throat> in the pandemic, in the beginning of the pandemic, I want to say I was exactly like you all. I was afraid of getting sick. I saw those videos from Wuhan and Italy. People were dropping dead. Freezers filling up in New York City, OK? We didn't want to get sick. I didn't want to get sick. My friends in Asia were worried about us and warning us, telling us not to get this virus, telling me not to go back to work, even if they begged me, OK? So I isolated myself, and I cared for my family. I wore my mask faithfully. We stopped meeting at church. We stopped meeting at school, our home school. And I cooked three meals a day for a year, OK? I'm tired. <clears throat> but you know, everybody did that. I know that. And we survived that first year pretty well in our valley, OK? OK, so, okay, so fast forward two years. We are now at the point where the virus is out there. There's no point in isolating. My husband had a test. His, he has antibodies to COVID. He never even got sick. I'm sure I did. OK, so in medicine, we have this thing called the benefit risk ratio for every treatment. Masks, no benefit, a lot of risk. Your time is up. My Thank you so for much that. for Thank your you. attention. Our next speaker is Adan Oseguera. Mr. Oseguera. Uh, hello, my name is Aldano Segueda. Uh, I'm employed by the district, but I'm here on my own behalf. Uh, somebody should tell those doctors who wear masks all day about no benefit. Uh, so the first thing I want to speak about are the masks. Uh, the Valley is the highest uninsured, underinsured region in Texas. One third of COVID deaths are tied to a lack of insurance. Uh, the program, the federal program that provides free COVID treatment, tests, vaccines is ending. If not, it, already, it has already ended. Uh, the CDC did a study comparing schools with a mask requirement, a complete mask requirement, uh, with schools with a partial or optional policy. And they found that there was a 72% reduction in cases. And all, that's, all that to say that if a variant hits us, it's going to hit us hard, uh, considering the demographics of the region, uh, if we're not prepared. Um, I don't know if we've seen some of the recent headlines from LA County that uh, recently did away with a mask requirement, and they are uh, undergoing outbreaks. Not good. Um, so I would just appreciate it if um, each board member, when they take this vote today on the uh, mask policy, if you state your rationale. Um, you know, staff's going through a lot, preparing for STAR. You know, I know we love data. I gave you a bunch of data right now. Um, so just hearing that rationale, it would uh, give us something to work off of, you know, um, and when election time comes around and our scores are low or students aren't in school or we're missing staff during star season, then we can know who to vote for. Um, other policies uh, have metrics in place. So they say if there's an increase by however many percentage or however uh, amount, they say, okay, there's no masks, but once we hit those benchmarks, then masks are back on. So. If there's going to be a revision, if it's not going to be kept in place, I would definitely suggest that. Um, but I would also say that once cases hit, it's already too late. If we know anything about math or if uh, we've had experience with Herbalife, you know, one goes to two, goes to four, goes to six, goes to eight, uh, so on and so forth. It's exponential. Uh, next, I want to talk about cheer. I'll be quick because I know we have a lot of uh, special recogni recognitions to get through. Um, I want to say how amazing it was how students and parents came to speak last week. I love seeing that community participation, and I, I hope that maintains. Um, al almost every student uh, that spoke last week I've worked with, uh, Dr. Cash or BC. Um, and something I want to remind those students is working in after school program, uh, we have inclusive dance teams and cheer teams. So if uh, everything stays as is, I want to remind them of the bonds and the camaraderie that they shared with. Uh, within those dance teams, within those cheer teams. 
I know there's other concerns, uh, and those should definitely be, uh, be listened to, but um, like I said, if nothing is done, you know, just there's positives there. Uh, take this opportunity, take the challenge, build each other up. Um, and I know some parents were talking about how it teaches uh, the kids a bad lesson, and I want to assure them that nothing's, this, uh, this decision's not going to undo 15 plus years of parenting, the guidance and the morals that they've instilled in their children. Okay, thank you. Mr. Oseguera, thank you. Okay, our next participant is Julio C. Longoria. Hello, morning, everybody. Um, I'm just here to have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm just here as a concerned parent, you know, ex-military, <clears throat> member of the Cameron County Conservatives. I just have a question. I mean, how long are we gonna like go on with this charade? I mean, I mean, Sam Brownsville doesn't have these, these guidelines. Harlingen doesn't have these mandates. San Benito's the last one, I mean, why? I mean, are people dying left and right? I mean, anybody's here? Relatives dying? I mean, why, why, why are we still having to wear this? I mean, it's, it's nonsense. Anyways, um, I mean, what's next? Or how long are we gonna keep on? I mean, do we have another month, two more months, three? Can you give us an answer? Anyway, that's, that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our portion of public comment for today. Moving on to special recognitions. I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Cervellon. Tonight, we're really excited to have all these students uh, in-house so that we can recognize them for all their accomplishments. I know it's been a while since we've had such a full house, but we're really excited. And I know the kids are excited to be here too. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it on to Mrs. Gon Ms. Gonzalez so she can continue for us. Good evening, trustees and Ms. Cervellon. Tonight, we will be recognizing 10 student groups that have recently made our district shine bright in the following areas. Academics, plant science, animal science, motorsports, naval science, and the arts. We are quite proud of them and all that they have accomplished. Tonight, their sponsors, directors, and principals are honored to present them to our governing body, interim superintendent, and our local community. Will Ms. Delia Cornett please approach the podium? She will introduce our 2022 Spelling Bee Regional Representative. Good evening, Board President Moreno, school board members, and Assistant Interim Superintendent Ms. Cervellon. It is my pleasure to introduce Sebastian Saldivar, a fifth grade student at Sullivan Environmental Science Academy and our district Spelling Bee champion who represented San Benito CISD at the 34th annual Rio Grande Valley Regional Spelling Bee held Saturday, March 5th in Edinburgh. The bee sponsored by Valley A Media Texas and Scripps National Spelling Bee went 36 rounds and Sebastian placed third. making him a runner-up for the Scripps National Spelling Bee being held in Washington, D.C. later this spring. This is the best performance by a San Benito CISD student at this level of spelling competition. Congratulations, Sebastian. Really. The purpose of the Spelling Bee is to help students improve their spelling, increase the vocabularies, learn concepts, and develop correct English usage that will help them all their lives. The Scripps National Spelling Bee is the nation's largest and longest running educational promotion. Sebastian is the son of Mr. and Mrs. Adan Salivar. And joining him are Sullivan Environmental Science Academy Principal, Ms. Diana Atkinson, and Assistant Principal and Spelling Bee Coach, Dr. Cynthia Claiborne. Will Sebastian's parents please stand and be recognized?
will Ms. Diana Atkinson, Principal of Sullivan Environmental Science Academy. She will be introducing our 2022 Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show Horticulture Award Honorees. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Savion, school board. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Last month, several of our Sullivan students competed in the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show. This provided our students with an opportunity to experience leadership development, agricultural education, and competition with the goal of creating the leaders for tomorrow. At this time, we would like to recognize the following students for their hard work and dedication to our Sullivan 4-H. We are also very, very proud of these boys and girls. Madeline Bernal is a fourth grade student at CESA. She placed ninth in trailers and vines. <laughs> Alexis Acuna is a third grade student at CESA. She finished first place with her beautiful flowering plant, as well as fifth place with her photography submission. Aubrey Loa is one of our fifth grade students that placed 10th in flowering plants. Fifth grade Krista Sexton placed 8th in photography and 7th in the succulent division. Jillian Perez is a fifth grade student with us at CESA and she placed 5th in the succulent division. Julius Resendez, fourth grade student, third place with his collection of herbs. <laughs> Delilah Via Gomez, also a fourth grader, placed 10th in the foliage division. John Perez, third grade student at CESA, placed ninth with his fern. David Rodriguez, also a third grade student, placed third with his bulb. Also in third grade, we have Matthew Atkinson. He placed sixth in photography and second place in the Vine Division. Haley Rocha is a fifth grade student at CESA who placed second in the Bulb Division. Juan Reta, also fifth grade, placed ninth in the photography division and tenth in the foliage division. <laughs> Jeremiah Via Gomez is a third grade student who placed second in the foliage division. Deandra Via Gomez, also in third grade, was second in her with her combination of herbs. Maverick Gonzalez is one of our fifth grade students. He placed fourth in his photography division and sixth in the foliage division. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors who work so closely with our students on a daily basis, Ms. Romana Cantu Gonzalez and Ms. Cora Mendez. Congratulations to all of our boys and girls.
Will Miss Mary Maney, Samuel High School math teacher and STEM sponsor, approach the podium? She will be introducing our Greyhound Motorsports award winning teams. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, Greyhound, the Greyhound Motorsports is part of the Green Power USA program. And the idea is the students take a kit, they design, they build, they present, they market, and they race this car. Competitions are made up 50% from the race, 50% from the presentation. The race is designed to be run on two 12-volt batteries for 90 minutes. No battery change, three driver changes. So it really is a very interesting competition that we have. At the current time, we have two teams under our... Um, under the, the roof of what we're doing, Team Pinky and Team Brain. Team Pinky is car number 77. At the current time, they are first in the state and third in the nation. Team Brain is car number 83. They are fifth in the nation and third in the state. So I uh, would be proud to present our students, starting with Heavenly Al Alaniz. She is a 12th grader. She is the captain of both of the overall on both teams. Armando Saldana, he also is a 12th grader. He is in charge of Team Brain. Uh, Javier Sosa, he is with Team Pinky. Andres Rodriguez, he is with Team Pinky. Moises Lopez is with Team Brain. Arnua Lopez is with Team Pinky. Marcos Ontiveros is with Team Brain. Brandon Rydell is with Team Brain. Eduardo Trevino is with Team Brain. Roman Romero is with Team Pinky. Geraldo uh, Gonzalez is with Team Pinky. Julian Gonzalez is also a 12th grader. He is with Team Brain. And one of the key people on our team is Naya Quinn Garza. She happens to be our media specialist, who is one of the reasons that Team Brain is in third place for the state. Our coaches are Sean Carney, Mel Hinosa, Richard uh, Fernandez, and myself. Everybody look over here. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. And the last one. One, two, three. Thank you. Good morning, board, or I'm sorry, good uh, evening, board members and community. My name is Chief Wilson. I'm one of your Naval Science uh, and JROTC instructors. Uh, this year, we're proud to uh, recognize our teams. 
they qualified at the Area 10 NGROTC State Drill Meet, placing first for unarmed drill and third for overall drill. And this isn't an easy task. The drill teams are composed of an R drill team, which is a nine pound rifle. Um, and then within the unarmed or the armed drill team, there's armed regulation and it's 56 steps that the students have to remember and get almost perfect. Then we have the unarmed exhibition show, which has a minimum time limit of six minutes and 10 seconds, no more than eight minutes. And uh, that gets very tiring. Uh, the team's also comprised of our academic team, our physical fitness team, and our color guard. And during this year at every meet, the max score that you could get for color guard is 500. And the lowest score we got was a 496. We're very proud of that. It would be mute to me not to also mention during their drill season, they placed at every competition we went to, which was five different drill meets in multiple categories. And this is the same team that came every day almost during COVID, knowing that they would not compete, but they still showed up to represent and be the pride of their community. The, stu the students are Alexa Rojas, Armando Saldana, Brennan Sanchez, Angel Santoyo, Samuel Santoyo, Maria Santos, Audrey Uoya, Gabriel Vega, Joanna Vega, Janae Vega, Nicholas Wilson, Emily Lerma, Angie Gonzalez, Jasmine Aka, Heavenly Alanis, Reina Bautista, Brianna Cano, Stephanie Castillo, Carolina Coy, Anthony Gomez, Daniela Hernandez, Gisela Hernandez, William Huffman, Juan Juarez, Ramiro Nunez. Our students are under the direction of Lieutenant Springer, Chief Wilson, and Chief Gaitan. Will the parents of these students please stand and be recognized? I now welcome Eddie Garcia, agriculture science instructor, to the podium. He will introduce our 2022 Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show Sale of Champions Honorees. Uh, school board members, uh, thank you for having such an event. Even though I know these things are monthly, it's very special to our students, our parents, that we get this recognition. And above all, you know, I talk to the kids in class. And they also, you know, at the times they'll say, oh, it's got scary, this and that. I said, no, you deserve this because you work hard. But to school board members, administrators, parents, and Ms. Servion, welcome home. Welcome home. To 
everyone that helps out. There's some board members out here that have been at the ag farm that their children raise animals and they see what everybody goes through. Not everybody wins, okay? That's not what it's about. However, parents do spend money on projects, feed, some go to the top. It's a learning lesson. It's like my old ag teacher, Mr. Sonny Brazil, used to say, Ed, what other organization has an actual project that's got a heartbeat? When that animal's yelling, it teaches them the responsibility to feed. When it's cold, they need shelter, okay? And even when they load that animal and they sell that animal at the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show on Saturday on that 18-wheeler, they cry, and that animal's still teaching them on how to let go, things that we experience in life. So this is a passion of mine, my fellow ag teachers, Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Guerra. We've done this for quite a while. Um, it's a hard thing at times because we want every child to taste victory. However, like I tell everybody, it's tough. At the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show, that's our Friday night lights and spring break. Football season, it's one team against one team. Spring break competition out there, there's a class of 40 pigs, 40 steers, 40 lambs. Our kids bumping heads with everybody. Only the top three make it to the cell of champions. So um, with that said, we want to introduce some of the ones that went to the top. Ariana Gonzalez. She had the grand champion, Red Brangus Heifer, and also had the reserve grand champion, Pinna Rabbits. Congratulations, Ariana. Lainey Leal, Lainey Leal. Student at BC, champion OPB, it's her first year. You should have seen the way this child worked all along at the Ag Farm. Very good, very competitive. Madison La Fuente, what a career. Madison? <laughs> champion crossbred hog, what a way to culminate the year. Desiree Valera, reserve champion lamb. <laughs> Leila Lial. One of our students at BC, one of our junior FFA students, and did a tremendous job also all year long. Kiana Jackson, champion horticulture plant. <laughs> Kiana, champion horticulture plant, congratulations to you. Abraham Garcia, this is one of our diversified students here. <laughs> reserve grand champion goat in his division. Abraham also had the reserve champion AOB steer a year-long project. Victoria Cantu, first place market hog. <laughs> Leila Lial, get your arm up. She's up here again. We're recognizing her again for her first place market hog again. <laughs> Alexis Sanchez. <laughs> she had a first place hog in her OPB division. Congratulations, tremendous job, junior FFA member. Austin Perez, Austin, come on. Second place, Market Hog. Austin comes to us from Frank Roberts Elementary, another junior FFA member, what a future. Nathaniel Claudio, senior at San Benito High School. Second place, second place with his Market Hog, what a tremendous career that student also endured. Abraham Garcia, where are you? Get your arm up here in the air. He also had second place Market Hog. Luke Leal, get your arm up in the air. Here he comes. <laughs> Luke and Layla are brother and sister. Luke does a tremendous job with his Market Hog, went second place. Then we go Ian Abrigo, second place with his Market Rabbits. <laughs> The next one, ladies and gentlemen, she is our FFA president. However, she is also district vice president, did a tremendous job, what a way to end the year. Heidi Trejo, second place market steer. She had, a, uh, she had a pig in January that won the district show and won the Sunny, uh, Sunny Brazil Classic show also. Very, very good, very competitive type student. The next one is Isaiah Guerrero, third place market hog at Mercedes. Maddie Becerra, third place, Market Lamb. Uh, 
Luke Leon, get your arm up in there. Third place, Marcus Drew with a hat up here. Luke, get it up. And Ricardo Castro, third place market steer in a real tough class. Uh, we want to say thank you real quick. Uh, I do on behalf of myself to my co-workers, Mr. Dominguez. Come on out, Mr. Dominguez. And um, <laughs> Mr. George Guerra, that's uh, teaching welding classes after school. Also, uh, Mr. Fernando Rosa, thank you, sir, our director. Get your arm up in the air, please, sir. Okay. This man, this man wears many hats, and he really, every student, not just in ag, but I'm, you should see all the, how he's everywhere. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gilbert Galvan, very, very important to us. Get your arm up in the air. <laughs> Mr. Rudy Ramirez, principal at the high school, very supportive also. <laughs> Above all, parents, from us to you all, parents, thank you so much because we see the roller coaster rides like in families at the Ag Department. But very, very important, we work things out for the common denominator, the students. Thank you. Parents, please stand and be recognized. Will parents please stand and be recognized. Can she see? I'd like to welcome Mr. Eradio Martinez, Director of District Choirs, to the podium. He will introduce our TMEA All-State Vocalists. Good evening, members of the board and all who are in attendance tonight. My name is Eradio Martinez, the Director of Choirs for San Benito CISD. Every school year, choir programs throughout the state of Texas compete in the TMEA All-State Vocal Auditions. This competition consists of several rounds, including district, region, pre-area, and area. These competitions begin in July and take place throughout the fall semester until they finally conclude in January. This school year, the San Benito Greyhound Corral achieved historic accomplishments during this process, including 35 students accepted into the district choir, which is more than any other high school in Region 28, which spans from Brownsville to Donna. Tonight, we will recognize three choir students from San Benito High School who advanced through every single round of the competition and received the prestigious honor of being named an All-State Vocalist. In addition to this achievement, this is also the first year in San Benito's history that we have a soprano All-State Vocalist and the first year that our school district has ever had a sophomore student to receive this honor. These achievements are a testament to these students' advanced work ethic, self-discipline, and also validate our position as the gold standard in music education. The following students were accepted into the Texas All-State Choir. Madeline Cardoza. <laughs> Nadia Garcia.
and Allison Rodriguez. I'd like to say thank you to these students for your hard work and dedication. You act as an example to your peers and have demonstrated the highest quality of competitive musicianship in our school district. I'd also like to thank the parents for allowing us to work with your children and putting your trust in us to provide them with the necessary instruction in their lessons and rehearsals to ensure their success. Finally, I would also like to thank my assistant, Mrs. Ana Garcia, who has worked with these students alongside me and has exhibited a great commitment to our program. Once again, congratulations to our all-state vocalists. Thank you, for member thank you, members of the school board, and we look forward to the progressive success of our choral program. Will our honorees' parents please stand and be recognized? I now invite Daidi Mendoza, our director of district bands, to the podium. He will be introducing multiple groups. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back to have the opportunity to recognize the students. This is by far my favorite part of my job, where I just get to boast for a little bit of the success of our students. As uh, you learned earlier from Mr. Martinez, that we have an our TMEA process. is a process that starts off at the region level, moving on to the area, and then the all-state level. The first student that we'd like to introduce to you guys this evening is Ryan Cavazos. Come on down, Ryan. Ryan is a senior and he is a trombone player. He is an all-state musician. He is an all-state jazz musician, in fact. And he earned this distinction by placing high enough at the region level and then at the area level, enough to become one of the best jazz musicians in the state of Texas. What? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very fortunate to be employed at a school district where our band program has had a long history of success at the TMEA process. We've had uh, as many as six All-Staters in the past and as few as one, but we've never had an All-State jazz musician in the past. And that's why it's so significant, Ryan's accomplishment, because it forges a path for future Greyhounds, for future generations to be able to follow in his footsteps. So we want to say thank you so much. And I know that we also have his mom back there because she actually went all the way to the San Antonio conference to see him perform. It was a great conference. Concert. So congratulations to his parents as well. I'd also like to take a moment, if it's okay, to introduce his teachers, Mr. Christopher Haynes and Mr. Miguel Aguiar, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Haynes is Ryan's trombone player. He's been his trombone, excuse me, trombone teacher. He's been teaching him how to play his trombone since Ryan was a freshman. And maybe a little bit before that, when he would go visit him at Miller Jordan in the past, Mr. Aguiar is our, one of our jazz teachers. So Mr. Haynes teaches him how to play the trombone, and then Mr. Aguiar teaches him how to play jazz. And it worked out great for everyone. So congratulations one more time to Ryan. Excellent. I'm actually going to have Ryan hang back a little bit because we're going to introduce the rest of the students who scored in area jazz as well. So if you can just wait right there with them and then we'll introduce the other students. So you've already met Ryan because the next group I'm going to introduce is our all area jazz musicians. This is the one level right before they become all staters. And the first one, as you know, Ryan, we're moving on to Mr. Guillermo Dorantes on guitar. He is an all area jazz musician as well. He's a freshman, mind you. 
future looks bright when our freshman is already making area on guitar. Congratulations. We also have Ms. Rianne Garcia on alto saxophone. And on drum set, we had Mr. Joshua Silva, who's a senior. I'd like to take a moment to also uh, introduce uh, Mr. Jorge Mujica and Mr. Noe Garcia, who are also teachers of these students here today. Beautiful. Thank you. That's all for them in the next group. I don't know. Maybe we should get all the groups in here, and then we'll do the picture, right? All right. Let's go ahead and move on, please. Uh, the next group of students that I'm going to introduce are the orchestra students. We have a string orchestra program, and we have some all-region orchestra students to introduce. And the first one is going to be uh, Mr. Sergio Mendoza. He's a senior. Our orchestra program is very young, but we already have some success coming in. We also have Carlos Panola, who's a sophomore. We have Yareli Rodriguez. A junior. And Israel Valdez. He couldn't be here today this evening, but we want to clap for him anyway. We also want to take the time to introduce their teachers, Ms. Karina Vela and Ms. Abigail Gonzalez, who are here this evening. On a different side of the Allstate process, we also have our Allstate band students who competed, and we actually had the highest member of students that we've had in recent history make this. We had 49 students make the All-Region Band, which was huge for us. We're very glad, especially considering this was the first time that all of these students did an in-person audition after what we went through last year, so we're very happy to have those numbers. From there, we move on to the pre-area level, and then it trickles over to the area level, and these are the students that we recognize on the area level. We we have on trumpet, Ms. Priscilla Alcala. She's a junior. <laughs> One of our flute players who also made the wind orchestra and TME band is Claudia Itza. <laughs> Not with us this evening, but still we should recognize her as Ms. Karina Luna, a sophomore. And uh, we also have on saxophone, Mr. David Pineda, tenor sax, that is. <laughs> We'd also like to take this time to introduce our flute teacher and also a VMA head band director, Ms. Dulce Rodriguez. She teaches the flute students that we have here. So. Our last group of students is going to be uh, what we are calling the Region 28 Inaugural High School Percussion Ensemble. Inaugural because this was the first time uh, that we actually uh, developed and made this ensemble and they performed. We actually had four of our students make this ensemble. We're very proud of them. And the first one is going to be Senior Jesus Mendoza. <laughs> and we, we have introduced previously Joshua Silva. Can you let everybody know where you are? Because he actually... Joshua earned two different distinctions. He was an all-area uh, all all area percussion as well as on the percussion ensemble. And so we're moving on to Adrian Villegas, who's a sophomore. <laughs> and we also have a freshman making this ensemble, which, uh, see what I mean by the future looks bright. We have a freshman, uh, in, uh, Hector Villegas, uh, on percussion. And I previously introduced Mr. Mujica, who's in the back. He's a percussion teacher back there. So thank you so much for everything that they do. And I do believe that concludes my presentation. I want to thank you so much for your time. And I'm overjoyed with the opportunity to be able to do this again with our students who have been working so hard for the past couple of years. Thank you. Any other parents? Any other parents, if you're standing, please raise your hand. If you're sitting, please stand up so that we can recognize you for all you do. La educación comienza en la casa.
excuse me, I, I left someone out. Mr. Rafael Garcia, who was our clarinet teacher, would like to introduce him as well. My apologies for that. All right, we're gonna move on with today's agenda. The next item on the agenda is item 3.1, annual announcement on continuing education of board members. Under state board of education rule, completing requ required continuing education each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. There are nine training areas for board member continuing education. One, local district orientation, all completed. Two, orientation to the Texas Education Code. Oscar Medrano and Mario Silva are scheduled for training. Three, post-legislative update to the Texas Education Code. Rudy Corona is scheduled for training. Four, team building, all completed. Five, Additional continuing education based on the framework for governor, governance leadership, all have exceeded. Six, evaluating student academic performance and setting goals. Rudy Corona, Orlando Lopez, Oscar Medrano, and Mario Silva are scheduled for training. Seven, child abuse prevention. Ariel Cruz, Janie Lopez, Orlando Lopez, Oscar Medrano, Mario Silva, and I are scheduled for training. Cybersecurity, number eight. Rudy Corona, Ariel Cruz, Janie Lopez, Orlando Lopez, Oscar Medrano, Mario Silva, and I are scheduled for training. And number nine, open government, over, I'm sorry, open government, OMA and PIA, all completed. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna continue as far as the training requirements for school board members. As, as of now, we've got noted, Rudy Corona has a total of 32.5 hours. Ariel Cruz has a total of 17.25 hours. Janie Lopez, total of 29.5 hours. Orlando Lopez, 27.75 hours. Oscar Medrano, 19 hours. Ramiro Moreno, 43 hours. 
and Mario Silva, 32.25 hours. Right, we move on to item number four, superintendent's report. Item 4.1, interim superintendent's remarks. Ms. Cervellon. Thank you, President Moreno. Good evening, everyone. Three weeks ago, I was blessed to be given the opportunity to return home and once again become part of the San Benito CISD team. Meetings with directors, campus administration, parents, and students have given me a current insight of some of the events and happenings in the district. As we move forward, we continue to evaluate our programs and processes in order to ensure our students are receiving the support, the challenges, and most importantly, the opportunities they rightfully deserve. With that being said, I ask that we stay focused on what really matters, our students' future. That means providing rich, rigorous academic opportunities and supporting our staff with the appropriate professional development and resources. Providing a gold standard education is more than just words, it's actions. And those actions need to be deliberate and targeted always thinking of the impact on our students. Our Board of Trustees is committed to providing our school community what they require to be successful, as am I. There will be times where we are challenged with issues that may deviate us from our primary mission. Just know that is part of the process. The important thing is to stay focused on our children and to regroup quickly because the stakes are too high if we don't. We are ambassadors for our district, ambassadors for our students. They, the way we express ourselves is key to how our community is perceived and evaluated by others. Our sheer and utter focus must remain on the task at hand, educating our students on how to assimilate into society. Together, I know we will get it done. And thank you very much for everything that you do. And with that, I'll ask uh, Ms. Bettis to come up and go through our financial reports. We can get the PowerPoint up, please. <clears throat> Good evening, President Moreno, members of the board, Ms. Servion. Tonight, I'm going to present to you the superintendent's reports and the financials that go along with the month ending for March 2021. 22, excuse me. First, we'll go over the bank balances. In our cash accounts, which are our first community bank accounts, we have a total of six million four hundred. Ms. Yes. Pettis, if I can stop you, can we uh, get sure. that on our screens uh, before us, please? Thank you, Ms. Pettis. We'll hold off a little bit. You let me know when you do see it, okay? Thank you. Okay, you wanna wait just a little? I'm okay with waiting if you are. The screens don't appear to be on. I'm not sure if they're on or not. There's.
It helps when we turn on the power. <laughs> no judgment, sir. <laughs> you can't even see the buttons. It's okay. <laughs> okay, we're ready? We're ready. Thank you. Yes, sir. Under our cash accounts for First Community Bank, we have a total of $6,490,049.44. Under our investment accounts, we have a total of an investment account balance of sixty-seven thousand four hundred and seventy-three thousand. I'm sorry, sixty-seven million four hundred and seventy-three thousand nine hundred and eighty-seven dollars and seventy-five cents for a total of cash and investment balance of seventy-three million nine hundred and sixty-four thousand thirty-seven dollars and nineteen cents. We'll go over the revenues in our budget first. Under the general operating fund, the year to date realized, which is the money that we have received up to date as of March 2022, is $74,492,967.93, which is a total of 63.48% of our entire budget. Under interest and sinking, we have received a total of $6,578,000. $689.44, which is a total of 80.48%. For a total of $81,071,657.37. Under our capital projects, this month we did receive $2,425.04 in investments. So that makes our total revenues, including the $40 million that we've received as part of the bond, to $40,905,000. $934.12. We'll go over the expenditures under general fund. Our year-to-date expenditures is $64,864,789.25. Under our interest and sinking fund, $8,149,536.03. For a total of $73,014,325.28. And under our capital projects, we have spent $15,263,266.69 for a total of 38.16% of our total capital fund account. So we'll go over the tax collections report. I did circle these just a little bit differently from what we usually do, just because as we get a little further into the fiscal year, we start overlapping tax year and fiscal year. So the ones in purple are current fiscal year, but last year's delinquent taxes. So that's gonna match up with the purple amounts that are on the bottom. And then the ones that are circled in yellow are our current tax roll. So those are our t uh, current tax collections. So we have received $15,226,028.86. That is a total of 88.38% of the entire tax levy. And compared to last year's, we are just slightly above. Last year was 88.22%. Does anybody have any questions so far? Do you all talk to the people that haven't paid their taxes? And do we know why they haven't paid? What are the reasons? So we contract out the county to do our tax collections. Linebarger is the one that does our delinquent tax collections. They're the ones that will go out and um, start reaching out to them and sending them letters and ultimately filing the, the court papers to to start those collections. So does Lineberger give you any feedback on that as to why the residents are not paying their taxes? They haven't given us a specific reason, but I can certainly ask and see if there's some, like a general consensus or some kind of something that's maybe a common denominator in what the, the replies are. But I can get that information for you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. I no think problem. one of the things that we need to mention as well is when we have delinquent pa taxes, it doesn't just necessarily mean from a year past. It could go back way back to 15, 20, 25 years. That's right. So uh, very often I know that, that I've been part of a presentation from Limebarger to where they can actually give us more exact uh, figures 
But just yes. important thing to know in case you all didn't. Yes. Is that something? Does, does, that's what I was going to ask. Does Limebarger, I think they have like a presentation that they Correct. do for the community and anybody can go in and they can kind of, because they do pretty much all the taxes, school, Correct. county, city. So if you'd like, we can ask them to join our May Finance Committee meeting and see what, if they have a thorough report that they can offer as far as what our delinquents look like and what delinquent taxes look like and, and the reasoning behind some of those and what their collection rates are. I know that she, she discussed a lot of that for us, but she's very helpful whenever it comes to giving us that information. That'd, That'd be, be great. great. Thank okay. you. If they can also, I know that they do trainings for other departments. Maybe they can let us know when they have those bigger tra trainings. That way we can attend. Yes, ma'am. I sure will. Okay. So this month we are going to go over the quarterly investment reports. It looks really small and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So in our quarterly investment reports, we do group them by which bank account we are going to be looking at. We'll talk about what the beginning balance is, additions, withdrawals, what has been earned, and what the ending balance is. So under the first community bank, we have earned $2,021.78 in interest. In Ameritrade, we have earned $1,017.71. That is an accrued amount, which means that that's a representation of what the interest would look like if we pulled those funds out today. So those will accrue over the next, um, the life of whatever their investment is. So whether it's three, six, nine, 12 months, those will still accrue. First public, we have earned $17,402.11. And under Texas class, $1,142.24 for a total of $21,583.83. And that is significantly lower compared to last year, which we had $64,734.80. Unfortunately, that is still a thing. I, I wish we could have better, you know, uh, I wish I had a better story to show you, but this is a nationwide issue that we're all facing. The good thing is that we are still on a positive note. So I'm very hopeful about that part. Next, we have the quarterly student and campus activity reports. <clears throat> so the total of those, and you do have the total up front as well as the details for each campus. The total that we have for our student and campus activity funds is $591,000. $121.24. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look over in case you have any questions. Okay, next we'll go over the quarterly federal funds. So when we did this report, we wanted to be able to show what the grant award was, what we've spent, what we've received, and the balance on it. We separated it by the grant year. So most grants are generally one-year terms. The ones at the bottom are multi-year terms, and those are going to be the ESSER funds. So we usually put the, the fund number at the end of the title, so you'll see 266, 211, 289. The ones on the bottom, they are all 282s. It's all a certain type of ESSER funds. And those will go over, as you can see, over from 2020 to 2024. So in total, of all of our grants, we have $67,270,396. We have spent $30,313,430.45. And our balance is $36,956,965.55. And the bulk of that, $26.8 is in ESSER 3. And that we do have until 2023. So it's not like we have to spend that right now, right now. And so one of the funds that you're not going to see on here that we had on the last quarterly report is the ESSER 2. That was the $20 million that was supplanted in the previous year. Since it's zeroed out, 
at that report, I took it off. So on this one, you'll see the first line says Esther Grant 266 is zeroed out. On the next report, you won't see it there anymore. And then the last one we have is the check register. <clears throat> Under general fund, $3,204,282.30. Student activity, $43,916.75. Construction projects, $1,179,359.08. Scholarship checks, $14,269.59. And that right there is not so much on scholarships, but more so on the expenses for our scholarship tournament. Payroll checks, $6,313,575.25. Payroll liabilities, $1,629,047.11. For a total of $12,384,450.08, which is pretty normal. We're usually at about $11 to $12 million per month. And behind that, you do have a list of the checks along with some of the ones that have some detailed information. If anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer that for you. I have a question on check number 1132. On which page, ma'am? It doesn't have a page number. It just says one of one. But it's um, towards the end. Oh, I see it. It has six zeros in the front. Yes, ma'am. And then 1132. Yes. Okay, on there, um, it says cash for SBCISD scholarship golf tournament uh, 2022. And then two down on 1134, it says startup money for the petty, petty cash box, $200. Um, I did have a community member that called me and asked about that, uh, why we're using, with why we're drawing cash out and uh, so I just wanted an explanation on that. Sure. So on the first one, the cash is for the prizes that we handed out. So it does equal out a total of $2,000. We do get a signed receipt from the recipients of those the tournament winners that they did receive X amount of dollars and then we do attach that over to the check so that we have backup on that part. So we can't we, we can't take our printer and our computer and all that other stuff to actually print out the check over there. And we don't have blank checks that we can just fill in a name and get signatures. So we did that along with the, the cash, along with the documentation that they received it. And that equals out to 2000 As far as the startup cash, that is so that we could have money in the box so that we could receive donations or ticket sales or whatever it may be. So when you look at that account, the details on it, it'll show very specifically that we are depositing, for lack of a better number, $5,000, and then separately will be that $200 that was startup cash reimbursing the account. Okay, and then the other question that I had was on some items that had some late fees. Um, 77, 51, 60, 77, 77, 44, 72, and this was with a Compass Bank, 77, 45, 72. So there's three items there that have late fees, and if we can get an explanation on that as well. I don't have the page number okay. with me. If it's I for just the wrote Commerce them Bank, down. I just wrote I'm them sorry down. to interrupt. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. If it was for the Commerce Bank, I don't see that specific check, but if it was a mm -hmm. late fee on the Commerce Bank, I can tell you that if you are one day late, they will charge you a percentage of a fee. And we are not very, it's not often that we are late. Um, I think this was probably the first in maybe two or three years that I know of. So there is a fee if we do not meet it. Uh, this had to do a lot with our Christmas scheduling and getting those payments and the backup paperwork, all of that on time. 
And so I, I do know that there was a late fee that was carried over. And what are what corrective measures are being taken to fix that situation, Ms. Servion, so that we don't have to be paying late, late fees and waste our taxpayer money? Yes, ma'am. So I know that right now we've actually been looking very carefully at all our accounts, seeing how um, we're reconciling for our banks as well. And so that's a process that me and Mrs. Perez are working through, or Mrs. Perez and I are working through, and I can give you an update on that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? We can talk finance all day if you'd like. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Perez. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, moving on to consent agenda, business and finance. Item 5.1, request approval to accept gifts, bequests for 2021-2022 school year. Questions? Consent. Item 5.2, request approval of budget amendments for 2021-2022 school year. Questions? I have a question. Item 5.3, request approval of the revised interlocal participation agreement with TASB Risk Management Fund Coverage Program. Questions? Consent. Item 5.4, request approval of proposals for RFP 1220, MCSD, Meals and Catering Services District-wide. Questions? Consent. Item 5.5, request approval of proposals for RFP 1221, Professional Consultant Services District-wide. Questions? I'm going to say I have a question on that. Item 5.6, request approval of proposals for RFP 1221, General Merchandise and Services for District. Questions? Consent. Item 5.7, request approval to extend the, the proposals for RFP 0321, Charter Bus Services District-wide. Questions? Consent. Item 5.8, request approval of financial comparison contract. Questions? Item 5.9, request approval of naming portable in memory of Chief Richard Williams, United States, United States Navy, retired. Questions? Consent. Moving on to consent agenda under administration. Item 6.1, request approval of new career and technical education high school courses. Questions? Consent. Item 6.2, request approval of the 2022-2023 Instructional Materials Allotment Antique Certification. Questions? Consent. Item 6.3, request approval of Texas Association of School Boards Executive Search Services. I question. Item 6.4, request approval of board minutes. Question. Consent. All right, so at this time, I would need a motion to approve items 5 5.1, 5.3, 5.4, 5.6, 5.7, 5.9, 6.1, 6.2, and 6.4. So moved. Okay, I have a motion by Ms. Uh, Janie Lopez. Do I have a second? Uh, Mario Silva seconds. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Okay, we come back to item 5.2, request approval of budget amendments for 2021-2022 school year. Mr. Medrano. I have a question on this budget amendment at Riverside Middle School. What is this about, Ms. Servion? Uh, is this related to the tennis courts? Yes, absolutely. So this is for the engineering services for the draining project at Riverside and the memorial, the Landry Memorial Complex. This was the additional amount needed for the engineering services that is that we discussed during the finance committee meeting. And the attachment in the back does show how much for each of those. So the Riverside one is for 19,000. 
and the Landrum Complex parking lot project is for 38,000. I do have a question on that. Um, when we hired this company, it's to build the tennis courts, right? That's why they're having to do some of that work at the Riverside? Yes. Okay. So when we hired this company, um, we hired them knowing that they had, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that they had an architecture that was going to put together the plans. And in the plans, they were supposed to tell us what it was going to cost us and what uh, it was going to, what the details were in building these tennis courts. Is there a reason why this was not brought up beforehand? And that's one thing. And then Mr. Weller, is this something that the district should be liable for or should the contractor be if, if um, it was an error on their part? No. Or if this is something we have to discuss in closed session, we can do that too. So this GDJ is for geotechnical engineering services and it's for surveying the site. And that was when they originally did the Riverside tennis courts, they went with some tests that were done several years back and they said that that was okay. Then they came back and said that that was not okay. So this is the additional cost for those tests, those soil tests. But, but shouldn't it be responsible of the company, of the, of the company that's doing the tennis courts? Mr. Waller? Is this? Hold on. So my question is, this amount is deducted from the amount that we have already approved the for the Is change? this an addition to the amount? It's this is an addition? An addition to the amount. Yeah, that's it. That part. So, um, the, 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 I'm sorry, hold on. Not part of the tennis courts. Okay. The tennis, the 19,000 is part of the tennis courts. Okay. So as far as whether or not it was part of the contract or whether they can be held liable for that one, sir? Yes, ma'am. I mean, to answer that question, I think what I would need to do is to, is to dig into the specifics of what the fee estimate relates to and whether it would be covered under the contract with the with the contractor and evaluate whether they should be responsible for that or not. So it, the, the long story short, I would need to look into that and evaluate what the contract says and what, you know, what the reasoning is for the, the fees and, and whether that should be uh, the contractor's responsibility or the district's responsibility. So. so Mr. Weller, this is an addition to the, what they had quoted us then? Or is this already included in that total? And are, you, you, are you referring uh, to Mr. the ninth? To the the river, 19,268 the right now. The river yes, sir. Matter. This is in addition to what was already quoted, and the reason I know that is because that's on one of our 25,000 and over purchases. So if we are considering holding off on this one, we, I would recommend that we consider holding off on that purchase as well until we get further clarification as to whether it's advantageous to the district or not. The board will, will recall that, that you considered a change order in regard to the tennis court project. And what I would like to do is understand what relationship this has to that, because it's coming from D GDJ, um, but of course GDJ is not the entity that's building the tennis court. So um, I'd be happy to look into it for you, Mr. Corona and, and, and members of the board. That would be great, because I, I thought that day when we had that discussion, mm -hmm. that was one of my specific questions, that there was, there was not gonna be any additional, any additional mm -hmm. uh, charges, and they said no, that was the total fee. The only thing he mentioned was, a gas line. A gas line. Right. Yeah. A major utility or something like that. And that's not a major, that's not a utility. Nope. Yeah, so my understanding was like this would be deducted from that, yeah. that amount that we approved that we prior. And that's not the case. As far as, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not privy to the information that was part of, the, on the contract. Okay, so that would be something we would need to get clarified. Yeah if this is gonna be deducted from that amount that we've already approved for the change order. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then for Landrum, this is for the parking lot? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So I think uh, as a board, we can decide to go ahead and vote on this and approve it if we want to as a board and have Weller look into it. And if, um, if it is something extra, then for him to handle the situation with the contractors. Mr. Weller, can we also vote on this agenda item uh, uh, excluding that section and then just, just bring it up at a, at a at Later, another, uh, future board meeting? Not approving this is going to delay something? Is it not going to delay something? That would be important too. We don't want to delay. Yeah, I was trying not to delay. That's why I was saying yeah. let's vote on it. Yeah. And yeah. with with the it's condition delayed. that Mr. Weller will look into the contract and see if it is something mm -hmm. that we would have to pay or not. So essentially, if this money is deducted from that amount we approved, right. everything is gravy. Okay. If it's not, if it's an addition, then it's something we would have to discuss at a later time. No. Mm -hmm. If I may, what you could do on this particular agenda item, because you have two different expenditures, one of them about which there are no questions, the VA health services matter. The second one about which there are questions. Um, you could make a motion to approve the VA health services uh, matter. And then as to the other one, uh, I would have to suggest uh, if you want to prevent any sort of delay, you could state, uh, you could approve them pending uh, examination by uh, the district's legal counsel and the, the superintendent, the interim superintendent, and provide us with the authority to um, finalize any negotiations as necessary in the best interest of the district. Right. I think that if you were to make a, make a motion like that and approve it, you would not be approving those expenses necessarily. You would effectively be delegating to myself and to the interim superintendent to investigate and determine whether it's proper and at that point to, to move forward with it. Or, and you would also be giving us the authority to say to the contractor, we don't think that's appropriate. Um, so if that's something you'd like to do, then we can do that for you. We can. There you go. So I would like to make a motion then to go in ahead, go ahead and approve these items pending examination by legal counsel and superintendent and giving them authority to make a decision in the best interest of the district. Do I have a, a motion has been made? Second. Second. Okay, Oscar Medrano seconds. Uh, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Six zero, motion carried. And, and I assume that authorizes Ms. Uh, Survey on to sign any documents as necessary depending upon the results of our review. Yes, sir. So that's that's the way we'll proceed, and I understand that is the intent of the, the motion the board just passed. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, agenda item 5.5, request approval of proposals for RFP for profession, uh, RFP 1221 Professional Consultant Services District-wide. So that is one that I had a question on, and I know that we've had various discussions in reference to the consultants that are on that, we've had presentations. Uh, my concern, and, and I don't know if this, and I'm going to refer to you, Mr. Weller, as well, and to uh, Ms. Servillon. My concern uh, is the uh, consultant titled Mark White Learning, LLC. Uh, I, as I mentioned already, we have had several uh, discussions. Uh, we have, we've had some really good feedback from some of our principals, uh, but, uh, I guess my question is, I'd like to ascertain that, that uh, in any event when we're paying out to this consultant, mm -hmm. that these expenditures do not exceed over the 50,000 uh, threshold for any given uh, contract or service being provided. So would that, does that, what, do you have an opinion on that, Mr. Weller? Yes, sir, and if, if the board would like to talk about that further, I think we could do so in closed. Uh, closed session. I think this is the kind of thing that could be moved to close. To the, All right. In terms of the legalities of that. But. Sounds good. Then I, I go ahead and move that we uh, move item 5.5 from the consent agenda, business and finance, to closed session. Do I have a second? second. Okay. I have a second by Mario uh, Silva. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6 0. All right. Then we go to item 5.8 request approval of financial comparison contract. Uh, Dr. Cruz, Ariel Cruz, you had a question? Okay, my question is, I, I tried to rewatch the committee meetings, but I guess I missed this part. Um, do we have a timeline for this 
um, study to be done? I don't have a timeline. We did invite uh, Josh Haney from Moat Casey, and he is online and available. We want to wait for him. Okay, and then while we're waiting for him, what are our goals to get out of this study? I know that Ms. Lopez is the one that requested it, so what is, we're gonna look at our cost comparisons. So as been discussed in previous board meetings, the goal of this is to compare our district to other districts as well and find out if we're on the right track when it comes to our expenditures and our finances so that we could be good stewards of our money and make sure that we're providing a good quality education with the students while using the funds that we do have um, with effective systems in place. Okay, and then second question is, this looks to be about a little in the area of about $15,000. That money is gonna be coming from what part of our budget? Depending on when we plan on doing this, whether it starts in July, whether we're gonna be doing this before the end of July, uh, we can... Budget it for next year? <clears throat> Correct. Okay. We do have Josh Haney online. Did y'all have any questions for him? Board members, anyone? Um, Mr. Haney, if you can just explain if there's anything that you might wanna add on what this uh, financial su study does. Yeah, and I apologize if I, I think there was a little bit of lag. I was watching it on um, Facebook, uh, the meeting, as well as uh, switching over to Zoom. And so um, I apologize if I missed any of the explanation, but basically uh, the, the product that, that we provide is called a financial data review. Um, and our staff selects five to seven uh, peer districts uh, we base that selection on geography, demographics, um, revenues that the, that the districts receive. Um, and then we compare uh, the district against those peers across a five-year period uh, and across all expenditure function categories. Uh, we also include student-teacher ratios, average teacher salaries, a number of other metrics, um, just to sort of uh, see how, the, how your district uh, uh, stacks up uh, compared to Others in terms of it, the spending decisions that the district has made uh, and sort of where it's allocating its resources. And uh, we also include some recommendations um, based on our analysis on, on uh, possible changes to financial practices and, and resource allocation at the district. Thank you, sir. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions, board members? I'm good, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you, sir. Okay, so at this time, I would need a motion to approve item 5.8, request approval of financial comparison contract. So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Janie Lopez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mario Silva. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Motion carries, five, zero. The last item under consent agenda that was questioned was item 6.3 under administration. Request approval of Texas Association of School Boards Executive Search Services. And I question that, and basically, uh, colleagues, I wanna reach out to you, and, and, and uh, uh, I know that we have uh, entertained different opinions, and so at this point, uh, based on the presentation or based on the statements that I have received from Mr. Silva, we have received from Mr. Silva and Mr. Uh, Medrano, y'all attended uh, a conference in Galveston uh, with uh, TASB services for a superintendent search. They, we also, during our uh, committee meetings, we also had a presentation. And basically, uh, uh, if I recall off the top of my head, I believe we, you know, their services would be provided to the district as, uh, with, for the price range of probably about $7,800, which is uh, very uh, comparable to, I'm sure, other uh, consulting services that we might uh, 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 reference. However, uh, in, in talking as well to uh, other board members and in our discussions that we have had, I know there's been some concerns raised just uh, verbally in reference to uh, are there any other uh, uh, con uh, consulting services that could possibly help us with our uh, future superintendent search. And so with that said, I wanna propose that, that uh, we don't uh, vote 
at this time on uh, going ahead and approving Texas Association of School Boards Executive Search Services, but rather uh, reach out to other, uh, other consulting service and see what, what they have to offer and, and, how, you know, and then make that comparison and, and then finally come to a vote. So with that said, uh, that, uh, I, I uh, move that we uh, not uh, approve Texas Association of School Boards Executive Searches, uh, Search Services and reach out to uh, uh, another, another firm or another service. Do I have a second? I have some questions. Yes, ma'am. So when we began this process of looking for a superintendent search firm, this was the only one that was requested because of the camp that from Galveston, and I also went to a search for superintendent course this last weekend in San Diego, and TASB is a network that connects to the National Association of School Boards, so it's yes. basically a huge network where they can pull superintendent Correct. candidates from. Why didn't we start looking at these different options a month ago? I don't have a direct answer for that. We uh, entertained the, uh, the notion of our two board members uh, that suggested TASB services because they had attended that. And then, yes, we did uh, in uh, San Diego attend uh, the, the search services presentations over there. Uh, again, I just, uh, I'm, I'm uh, re going back to the conversations that we've had. It wasn't unanimous uh, just in, in our conversations that we wanted to go to TASB, and I'm not saying that we will not go with TASB, uh, but I, uh, and, and what I agree. What, what conversations are these because? The ones that we had in our, in our uh, committee meetings. Committee meetings. When we were here at our committee meetings, there was people that brought up, you know, are there other, there, were, uh, there was a couple of board members that mentioned other potential uh, serv uh, services that we could reach out to. Okay, so. TASB's presentation that they came last week is going to be in a, added to these other presentations that we're getting from these search firms. What's our timeline? What was our timeline with TASB and what's we our timeline We don't have a now? timeline. At, at this point, there is not a timeline. Okay, so the, so, so we're, we're going out to, to, you know, TASB says their timeline would run anywhere between 90 to 120 days. Three to four months. Okay, which is fine. But uh, I'm also recommending that we give other services an opportunity to come present to us as well. Okay. I personally think it's a good idea because I know that TASB provides a lot of the services for us and I don't want it to look like a, it's a monopoly and we're just getting everything from TASB. And if we have other opportunities to see what other firms are out there in the community that we can utilize, I think that that would be great. Is there a reason, Ms. Cruz, uh, that you would not want us to look for other services to see what other companies are available? Yes, because of the timeline that we have to get a new superintendent. I would like for us to not be wasteful on time, to be thorough enough that when we start the school year, we start off fresh and we have everything in place. And I think that's an important point that you're saying that we need to be very thorough and that's why I think that we should wait and not rush on anything and see which is the best company for us to I have to, to agree utilize. with you guys. We need, we need more other companies to, to apply for this search and I, I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, it's transparency. And so, if I recall, uh, just a, a basic comment that Ms. Lopez made uh, sitting next to me during those committee meetings and it just appeared that way. It wasn't a, a derogatory comment but uh, TASB services provides multiple services, not only in, uh, ser superintendent searches, but I mean, we're part of TASB as board members. But, uh, but again, I wanna reiterate what you said, and, and this was just in confidence here, ne right next to me uh, during the, the committee meetings, is I get, you know, the comment was made, well, it seems like they monopolize. And I'm like, well, they're Texas. They're Texas Association of School Board, so they're part of a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, different services that, that they provide for the state of Texas. So going back, uh, I, there is a motion. I, I went ahead and moved. Uh, is, is there any further discussion? No. Okay. Do I have? I, I move that we uh, that we postpone uh, going with TASB and uh, and seek out with the uh, help of uh, possibly Mr. Weller as well to seek out other uh, search services. Do I have a second? Okay. On that. Second. So Mr. Weller is going to be the one reaching out to the services, not our purchasing department. It can be either or. It, it can also, it, it can be the purchasing department, and, but, but it can also, Mr. Weller can also provide some feedback. In conjunction. In conjunction with our department. So and just to clarify, I just want to make sure that um, for those TASB listeners, 
I want to make sure that it's nothing against the company. Of course not. It's just that we're just looking for other options, and who knows? Maybe TASB will be the best option. But we just wanted to look. Uh, I think that as a board, since we've been the majority, we've always looked at what other options are out there versus just going with the first vendor that we come across. Okay. On that so note, I do want to say I do sec second that motion, and I think that we um, if we can do a point of order to go ahead and take a vote. Well, I have. Uh, Another question. I, I will allow a question, ma'am. So are we going to do um, basically like an open bid where people can present their bids, or is Mr. Weller, the purchasing department, directly reaching out to different firms? Actually, no. I think I think the correct thing, in, in retrospect, the correct way to do this is go through Mr. Eddie Cavazos and, and put out a request for qualifications, and, okay. and uh, that would be the, the, the correct route to go. I agree. Okay. So with that said, uh, we do have a motion by myself and a second by Ms. Lopez. Uh, do, uh, by a show of hands, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Can you repeat the motion? Yes, the motion is to uh, basically postpone going with the Texas Association of Schools, School Boards Executive Search Services and have our, uh, our uh, purchasing department put out a request for qualifications for other uh, consulting services that will help us with the superintendent search. Okay, uh, so with Mr. that said. Mr. Uh, Marino, uh, yes, sir. one just thing I might interject. I would probably a request for proposals would be the, the vehicle in this instance. And I don't think that the dollar figure will trigger it, any of those RFP requirements, uh, based upon what we saw from TASB, but it would be an RFP. Not, not an RFQ? RFQ, yes, sir. Okay, so I, I stand corrected. It'll be an RFP through our purchasing department. Okay, one more time. Repeat the yeah. motion, please. Okay, the motion is to postpone uh, making a decision tonight uh, utilizing TASB, Texas Association of School Boards Executive Search Services, and using our San Diego CISD Purchasing Department to go out for RFPs uh, so that we can see if there are any other services that we would like to consider. So we do have a motion by myself, a second by Janie Lopez. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Motion carries five, zero. All righty, uh, we're moving on. We move on to action agenda items. Item 7.1, discussion, consideration, and possible approval regarding purchases over 25,000. Ms. Cerreon. Yes, sir. Uh, we do have several purchases over 25,000 that we have put forth for your consideration. Uh, I will uh, turn it over to Ms. Bettis to go ahead and specifically delineate the purchases that we are currently required and they are essential. Thank you, Ms. Edrion. So the list of vendors that we are requesting that have purchases over 25,000 are College Board, Dell Technologies, GDJ Engineering, that goes back to the, the budget amendment. Mm -hmm. Liberty Paper, we have purchased from Liberty Paper, however, it has not reached the $25,000 threshold. This purchase would exceed that threshold, so we are bringing it at this time. I have a question on that, Ms. Perez. Yes. Are we, are we okay with Liberty Paper? They're out of Los Angeles, California, and I'm reading all this email that they don't guarantee that the, the paper that we order would be available. Are we okay with them or Liberty Paper? Liberty Paper is the vendor that we usually do use. And really? I have not, not that I know of, had any any issues with that. Mr. Cavazos, have we had any issues with Liberty Paper? And I know that's not the only source of paper that we have. Isn't we did there, go out isn't for there one in Texas that we can use? I mean, out of Los Angeles, California? <laughs> yeah. Good evening, sir. No problems at all with the paper whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they've been very good on delivery. Okay. Machines take them very well. Uh, I think just for your information, we might be going out for bid because the contract is up okay. already. Okay. So we're going to be going out for bid. Okay. okay. That's so, I no, we haven't had any problems. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cavazos. Back to the vendors. We have Onward Learning, RCI Technologies, Reality Works, and Video Tech Systems. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions about any of the vendors or any of the purchases itself? Questions, anyone? We have to take out the GDJ right. engineering. 
Can you repeat that, Dr. Cruz? We have to take out GDG engineering. Okay, so with that said, we can still entertain a motion. Do I have a motion to approve that uh, um, the purchase is over $25,000 with those exceptions? So moved. Second. Okay. But if you take it out and me and Mr. Weber can kind of have it. Okay. Remember, that was the motion. All right, so let me reiterate that motion once again. We're going to, uh, the motion is to approve the purchases regarding, uh, I'm sorry, approve the purchases over $25,000, but how, uh, with this GDJ engineering uh, being pulled out, but. I, Miss, I'm sorry, Mr. Weller, should they pull that GDJ out? They've given us authorization to, to go sign. ahead and move forward with it if it, it is essential to proceed. I think what the board could do, just to clarify, is note that uh, the approval of GDJ is consistent with its motion earlier in this meeting. Okay. Is conditional and and cons conditional and consistent on the motion from earlier in the meeting. All right, once again, I, uh, let's go back and, and uh, uh, revisit this motion. So we need a motion to go ahead and approve the purchases over $25,000, including GDJ engineering, consistent with the conditions discussed and the motion provided earlier during the meeting. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. Okay, we had Oscar Medrano. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Silva, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you for that. All right, moving on to item 7.2, discussion, consideration, and possible approval of district calendar for the 2022-2023 school year. Ms. Cedrion. Yes, sir. Um, so we recently did have a district-wide vote for our calendar for the following school year. It was actually a pretty close race um, for the top calendar. We have Ms. Gonzalez that will go ahead and walk us through that. to take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison page. We had originally come up with options A, B, and C. Uh, the only real, signific the significant difference was in the holidays. You know, this allowed us to start, um, first day for teachers would have been August 3rd. First day for students, August 10th, and graduation would fall um, May 26th. Uh, the leadership team then decided to, instead of starting school for students on a Wednesday, that it was best that we start school on a Monday. So option D starts first day for teachers, August 1st, first day for students, August 8th and graduation still remains on, the, on May 26th. We originally took it to the Superintendent's Advisory Council for a vote. However, we only received 45% votes. So it wasn't truly representative of the staff. So Ms. Servian, Ms. Servian and I discussed to simply take all four options to all staff, which is what we did um, via Survey Monkey. If I can get the Survey Monkey results up. Okay, this only includes those employees that were able to vote online. And the top, the top calendar was calendar D with the earlier start. We also, um, you go to the, the, the voting results, our maintenance, transportation, custodial, and child nutrition program staff voted uh, paper votes. They actually submitted signatures for their vote. So this gives you a, an overview that 1,221 employees voted, and the top 
um, vote, the top voted calendar was calendar D. So that is the, the calendar that is being recommended this evening. If I may, I would, I would uh, like to commend you all for doing uh, this voting on the school calendar as you did. Uh, it, it's more, uh, it's all inclusive. The different departments, different, you know, uh, areas were able to uh, contribute to that. And so I think that uh, the selection process was, was really good. So thank you for that. Any questions, board members? I want to make a comment also. Um, I'm very appreciative of you including maintenance, transportation, custodial, child nutrition. Um, as I had expressed in the past when I first started as a board member and we addressed the calendar, that was one of the things that I did bring up, saying that some of our hourly staff that doesn't have the ability to have a computer next to them, they would be left out. And so the paper surveys for them is greatly appreciated. So thank you, Ms. Servion, for doing such a tremendous job. I have a comment. Um, so I'm noticing that calendar A, B, and C all start on August 10th. And calendar, calendar D is the only thing that, the only one that starts on, the only option that starts on August 8th. My question is, I wonder if that would have affected the results if there were only two, two options on the eighth, on the starting dates. How many years have we been starting on a Wednesday? This would be the second year. Okay, and then every year before that we start on a Monday? Traditionally, yes. Okay. That, that I can recall, I believe this would have been the second year. Okay. I have a question on the teacher preparation days. You have seven. Um, is that any different from this past year? These are the original seven teacher prep days. The others were, there was a different name to them, Ms. Alvaro. The extra ones that were, um, that we had this year was a waiver that we submitted uh, to uh, TEA and it allowed for <clears throat> an additional either seven or 10, Mr. Martinez, I can't remember, but they just needed us, it might have been minutes, it just needed us to just, to just key it in and make sure that you know, we kept and we didn't go over. I believe we used maybe five, five of those, I think it was 10 that they offered. That's it with the waiver that we requested. But we, those are not in here. Those were additional this past year. Thank you, ma'am. Uh -huh. any, other, any other questions, board members? Okay, so if not, I ask for a motion to approve district calendar D for the 2022-2023 school year. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Ariel Cruz, second by Mario Silva. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Did you have your hand up, sir? Yes, yes, sir. Five zero. Sorry about that. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, item seven point three: discussion, consideration, and possible approval of rescinding the mask mandate resolution. Okay, and I guess I turned that one over to me since I put it on the board agenda. So uh, basically, folks, we we've heard pros and cons. I know that uh, at at the onset of uh, the pandemic. We, uh, we were all worried, as has been mentioned by uh, public comment before and by our, our nurses and, and uh, you know, and we did our best to keep everybody safe. And uh, the conversations that we had at one of the previous board meetings is, is it's, uh, you know, they're very uncomfortable. We feel our kids need to be given the choice uh, to no longer be mandated to wear the mask as, as are our teachers. It is concerning, I'm not gonna lie, uh, it's still scary. I, I, I am full aware, and, and I'm sure that, that the majority of you keep close tabs on, you know, the increases and decreases uh, throughout the nation. Uh, you know, now there's another variant, and is there a possibility that, you know, that it could affect the Rio Grande Valley? Can it affect our, our state? Yes, it can. But at this point in time, I, I do, uh, I've been keeping up with the presentations or with the reports that are provided to board members on a weekly basis. I, I feel, and this is my opinion, that our, the cases have come down drastically almost to none, which is a good thing, and I uh, thank God for that. 
Uh, I don't, I, you know, it, it was a crazy time of year. And so uh, once again, uh, I would like to, uh, and, and I will uh, encourage any type of discussion among our board members, I would like to recommend that we remove that resolution and, and change that from a mask mandate to an optional use of masks. But I also want to mention that if, uh, you know, keeping close eye, a close eye on CDC and, and uh, continuing changes that are, are upcoming, uh, because if we need to go back, perhaps develop another resolution in the future, uh, that's what we're here for. Because first and foremost, the safety of our students and the safety of our faculty and staff is of utmost importance. So once again, I go back and, and my recommendation is that we remove the resolution and the mask mandate and make it optional. Do I have any, uh, any board members that would like to contribute? I, I totally agree with you, Mr. Moreno. We get a report of students that had COVID and in February, there were 225 students reported COVID. In March, 12 students. In April, one, one student. So I, I agree with you. Uh, we need to make it optional. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Rodriguez. First of all, I'd like to start off by thanking you and your department for all their hard work. Second off. I second that. Thank you. Great job. I'd also like to thank the board for pushing it to after spring break. So what do our numbers look like after spring break? Um, that is uh, accurate. What was reported was that for April, for students, we've had one uh, reported case, and for staff, we've had none. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. So in your opinion, this is... I do. Um, based on the information we have, um, and also on the CDC, Cameron County has been um, made as a low risk um, county at this time. Of course, that can change. And um, I know someone mentioned previously in the public comment about maybe having a scale. parameters on a, if we see like a 25% increase or something like that, that we would um, reinstate it. But um, as of right now, I feel that uh, with our cases being one case as of to date for April, that that would um, be a, a okay decision to make. Okay. And then on this, the second thing about it is completely removing the resolution. I believe the resolution has a parameter where the superintendent would be the one to decide whether we would need it back or not. That way we wouldn't have to come to a board meeting and just if something goes crazy within the next couple of months, next couple of weeks before a board meeting, I believe the resolution does have that the superintendent can reimpose the mask mandate. So that is already built into the resolution itself. Is that correct, Mr. Weller? Or do we need to develop a, another resolution in its, in its entirety? I think that the, the terms of the resolution state that the board authorizes, I'm gonna read from that provision. Okay. The board authorizes the SBCISD superintendent to advise all students, staff, visitors, and parents of the existence and application of this resolution through any appropriate measures. So I think that the superintendent's role was one more of passage of information um, rather than allowing him to put it in place or not. I'm looking at the copy of the resolution adopted September 7, 2021. So with that said, Mr. Weller, I mean, it, it, we've got one in place already, and I'm sure I, I, would, I would imagine that we would basically mimic what we already had in place. So to come back because of a, of a spike in COVID or any other variants, uh, to come back uh, uh, as a board and, and make that decision to uh, maybe reinstate or instead of just reinvent the wheel, reinstate the previous uh, uh, resolution would uh, be probably more feasible, do you agree? If uh, you could do one of two things, you could you could place authority in the superintendent or the interim superintendent to reimpose it at his or her discretion. Um, and you could state that it could be reimposed until such time as the next regular board meeting or something like that so that the board would have an opportunity to, to act upon it. Or you could um, just state that, you know, it's rescinded at this time and the board will will uh, reimpose it if you find it necessary. So you could go either one of those directions, I suppose. Okay, so at this time, uh, is there any further discussion, board members? 
Okay, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion that we rescind, it, rescind the uh, resolution altogether and make the mass mandate, mandate for San Diego CISD optional. Uh, do I have a second? Second. We have a second by Ms. Janie Lopez. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Motion carries six, zero. Yay. Thank you. We can breathe now. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item. We have item 7.4, discussion, consideration, and possible approval of revisions to the 2021-22 compensation plan. Uh, Ms. Herreon. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, Dr. Cruz will be actually going through the specifics of what we are moving forward with. I know that we wanted to address our summer uh, pay for our staff. So with that, Dr. Cruz, could you please delineate? Yes, good evening, President Moreno, members of the board, Ms. Herreon. Uh, the revisions that we're bringing to the board today include the following. Uh, the first revision is the inclusion of secretary for ASP slash program assistant. Uh, this is instructional support for after school and high impact tutoring. Uh, we were awarded a grant, the T class 11 grant, uh, to help with the requirements of House Bill 4545. Uh, we were awarded $812,500, uh, out of which $312,500 go towards personnel, and this position was included in the TA grant budget. We also have included multi-purpose vehicle bus driver that is new to our compensation plan under pay grade five. Uh, we've ordered five smaller buses uh, that can carry 14 passengers. This will hopefully alleviate some of the bus driver shortage that we are all experiencing. Uh, it does not require a CDL license. Uh, the driver must pass a non Department of Transportation drug test and the person, the driver performs all duties of a bus driver. This is for 187 days at pay grade five. The summer school rates are being revised with a board's approval. A professional clerical staff would be $25 an hour. Paraprofessional LVN, $35 an hour. Teachers, nurses, RNs, professional certified specialized, $50 an hour. Administrators, $2,000. Maintenance, employees, not employee maintenance, but working summer school in the department, $11. For the administrators, it's, a, it's basically a stipend? Yes, ma'am. A one-time amount. We've also. So this is for uh, employees not employed in maintenance that we bring over into maintenance that assist during the summer with special projects. They will receive eleven dollars an hour. Can can you? Uh, I'd like to. Uh, I want to question that. You know, the, this is. Uh, these are the summer months. And, and uh, our, our maintenance employees, not employing maintenance, but working on summer school uh, on, on various projects, as you mentioned. Uh, I guess this question would be addressed to Ms. Perez. Uh, $11 seems kind of slim, uh, especially with, with the hard work and the hot weather. I know that in the past we've had, uh, and I'm just gonna uh, make some random statements. I, I recall uh, other occasions where We've had uh, workers, uh, you know, and these may have been maintenance workers, but however, they're still individuals, they're humans, working in the hot sun, uh, uh, painting uh, aluminum bleachers and things like that. And I, to me, just personally, I think $11 is, is very, very uh, low. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what our budget would, would uh, look like and how it would impact. I mean, it's gonna impact it negatively, of course, but because we're gonna spend more money, but. Could any thought be given to possibly uh, raising that, that uh, dollar amount? So Ms. Serviona and Dr. Cruz and Ms. Alvarado and I did talk about what that amount would look like. It was originally at $9.36. Okay. And the intent of raising that amount was mostly because it's hard to get 
individuals to come over and work summer school after having worked the entire year. So that number was in proportion to the amount that was being increased on the other levels. However, we are completely open to any suggestions that y'all might have. The budget is dependent on ESSER fund availability. And as you can see, we have $36 million, 26 million specifically in ESSER that we still need to spend over the next two years. So that would not have a big fiscal implication on it. Can we do $15 an hour? If that's what y'all would like to, it's totally within y'all's. Okay, I have a question because this came up in a previous board meeting where we raised um, pay on a certain class of employees and then someone that may do that work didn't get that raise and it made kind of a an issue. So if this, this maintenance is employees not employed in maintenance but working summer school in this department. So this may be transportation people, things like that, correct? Child nutrition. Child nutrition, okay. So how much do our actual maintenance people make during the summer? There you go, that was my question. Well, the maintenance uh, employees that are working in maintenance, they receive their same pay. Which is at? Their rate, whatever rate that they are placed at, they continue receiving their same pay. So this rate is for anyone outside of the department that will be assisting with different projects. It could be a painting project that, you know, we're catching up on a pa painting around the district and, uh, you know, child nutrition employees may be interested in working those projects, they would be paid this rate. So they could, like a child nutrition person could essentially come to the maintenance department for painting and be paid more than the maintenance than person. Than a regular job, that, that is their job. Be, let me check on it depends. This. It depends. How many months in the summer are they gonna work? Two months, probably. Dr. Cruz? Uh, June, July. June and July, okay. I just wanna make sure that we're not taking care of the people that are already doing those jobs as well. So, so what are the, what's the possibility? And that's a good question, Dr. Cruz, because I, I think I, I see what you're, you're saying and correct me if I'm wrong. You know, if we're upping that, that dollar amount to $15 and that's gonna be a, 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 a dollar amount that surpasses the people that do their job on a regular basis, then you're, you're correct, that may be, you know, seen as a problem later on. Yes. And we, we did get those, those concerns earlier when we, we uh, uh, chose to uh, provide raises for certain uh, departments. So is there a, a possibility then that that $15 would very well or very likely uh, be more than what our current employees are, are making in their capacity? It may oh, yeah, be. So for example, pay grade one uh, in, out of the auxiliary pay scales, custodians, bus monitors, CNP associates, uh, starting pay is 969. There you go and the maximum is 1508. So I feel that $11 would put it at a, at a safe amount. This is all extra money that employees are choosing yes. to take and they know the amount that they're gonna be receiving. So for these um, employees that are willing to come in the summer and work those extra days, can we consider maybe a stipend? Um, and that way we can make it across the board for all departments that are coming in in the summer. And I know that in the past also the bus drivers don't have work and if, if minimal bus drivers might get a job during the summer and then they're not able to qualify for unemployment for the, those months that they're off. So is there anything that we can do also for those departments that do struggle with that? Is there work for them as well? Can we do a stipend for these departments? Mm -hmm. And what I would like to say, it's not only going to impact these employees in maintenance, because if you look at our paraprofessionals as well, we have some paraprofessionals that work year round. So if we're doing the $25 an hour, that would also impact them. So the way we kind of leveled the playing field, especially for our professionals and our administrators, is to up their stipend because they are still on contract mm -hmm. initially. And then so that stipend was lower. We upped that stipend best based on our funding. The only fair thing to do is if we're upping it, because we're never going to have the same level playing field if we increase these amounts for our hourly employees. It's just not gonna happen. Is if we consider a revisit of a stipend uh, for the employees that work throughout the summer, if that's what you want, or if we go back to our original pay scale. That is the, those are our solutions. 
unless you see something else, Dr. Cruz. That would be I the agree. only way for it, yes. where it would be equitable. Yes, ma'am. So do you want us to come back with to, to you with a new proposal? I think that would be, I think that would we be We still have best. time, so. That would be the best solution. So you'll probably be having employees uh, earning more than the regular maintenance employees. Right. That's, that's yeah. our, se our clerical and, secretaries, yeah. uh, anyway, clerks, it. yes. Right, and also if y'all can consider those departments that don't have a job in the summer and see if you can consider them also. Okay. Okay, so then we'll revisit the summer school portion. When yes, do you when do when does staff start to decide when they're gonna, that they're going to start working summer school? They will start at, in June, but um, the important thing is we are pushing out um, an application for the summer, so we wanted to have you know numbers uh, because when they apply, we wanted to be able to compensate them well. And as I explained at the other meeting, the, the employees have been stretched. Uh, you know, some of them do not want to, you know, work in the summer. They want to take the summer off. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make it advantageous for them by increasing these numbers. Yeah. But what we could do is if you want to, you know, just look at our hourly and then come back and we'll come back with a plan for hourly employees. I have a suggestion. I suggest that we approve it like this, mm -hmm. maybe look at to see how much money we'll have for stipends that are available. Because nobody's going to say no to extra money if we decide in June that we're going to give the summer school employees extra money. But the money is there, Dr. Cruz. We're, we're utilizing ESSER funds, and we have we have plenty of ESSER funds to be able to utilize. That. I understand, but, but like Mrs. Sedvion mentioned, she wants employees to have an incentive to start applying for these positions. That way we know exactly where we're at and where our needs right. are for staffing summer school. So I, it, in other words, it's only going to go up from these numbers. It won't Possibly. go down in any way. Possibly, right. Mm -hmm. right. So if we approve it as is right now, we can come back in a later meeting and maybe when would they start, increase that. I'm sorry, I'm when would they start applying for these positions? Uh, we should be opening up that application end next April. week. Next yes. Tomorrow? Yes. End of April. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. If we wait till May, that still gives them about a month to apply. No, it's yeah. a it's a two week. We'll open it for two weeks, and we start seeing how we're going to staff. And so currently, we're already looking at numbers, exactly. uh, student numbers, you know, for enrollment for the summer, and we have our different programs there you go. that we're targeting. I'd like to make a motion that we approve it as is right now, and then if we look at that money and see how much we have to give later. Okay, do I have a second? We have a motion on the floor to approve the revision to the 2021-2022 compensation plan as presented. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, motion by Ariel Cruz, second by Rudy Corona. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Motion carries six, zero. Next item under action agenda item is item 7.5, discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding board member etiquette and board unity. And I guess I'll turn that over to myself since I'm the one that put it on the board agenda. But uh, I'm sure it will elicit a, a little discussion. Uh, the reason I put that on the agenda, uh, colleagues and, and fellow members of the board, is we have received, I, I don't want to say a multitude, but we have received multiple training in reference to board conduct. We have received uh, uh, training that went at the onset of, I know it, at the onset of, I, of me becoming a board member and then the others that came in at a later time received uh, trainings on board operating procedures as well. Uh, there's been discussions and, and some of the things that I hear uh, loud and clear and I've, I've been guilty of saying that myself and, and I don't necessarily like it. You know, we hear uh, comments about the board minority. We hear comments about the board majority. And, you know, it, when, we, when we look at board policy, when we look at operating procedures, you know, it's a board. We are a board. It is a board of a team of eight when we, you include our superintendent and or interim superintendent. And, you know, everyone has an opinion. We all have opinions. And, and, and you know, we have freedom of speech. And so we're, we're able to, to give our, opinion, our opinions to our friends, family, and public. You know, but, but there are also guidelines that when we took our oath as board members, we, we need to adhere to. 
So the reason, my, my ultimate goal of placing this item on the, uh, the agenda is to ultimately challenge the team of eight, challenge our seven board members and our leader. Uh, at this point, we have an interim superintendent to continue to try to work together as a whole. And once again, I'm going to reiterate, we're, we're not going to agree on everything, you know, but I think more and more as, as uh, we have progressed, uh, we have slowly uh, demonstrated more respect toward each other. I also noted that, you know, uh, uh, we just went to a, a, a board conference in, in, uh, in uh, San Diego, California, and we learned a lot. And at the same time, it wasn't perfect, but uh, I think that we need to learn to communicate more. I think one of the issues, and I, I'm saying it blatantly in front of our community, in front of our staff, in front of our uh, administrators, you know, we're human just like you all, you all are. And, and you know, uh, I think that sometimes the communication is lacking, okay, because I, I honestly believe that every single member on this team, okay, elected and made the choice to run and represent their community. But bottom line, I'm going to venture to say that each and every one of us here today is here for our district and ultimately for the success of our kids. With that said though, I do wanna make some, I, I, and these, I'm going to, to remind board members that, you know, I, again, we have board policies, we have board member code of ethics, and I wanna make reference to some that I'm, I'm concerned about and hopefully after my discussion and after, and, and again, you, you, know, you will be provided the opportunity to join in as well. Hopefully we will all be on the same page because this discussion is once again, my goal is to promote unity, teamwork and, and to continue working together. So one of the things I'd like to remind all of us, okay, not that you don't know and I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, is that we do have board member, uh, board member ethics, okay? It's BBF local. In the board member ethics, we uh, have equity and attitude. We have trustworthiness in stewardship. We have honor in conduct. <clears throat> we have integrity of character. We have commitment to service. And we have student-centered focus that we all took that oath either in May or in November when some of us came on board. And with recent events, it's concerning, and I think it's important because there's a lot of misfacts, miscommunication that has gone out to the public, okay? And I wanna just set the record straight, okay? First and foremost, again, with the goal of promoting unity, but also shedding light to our community, to our administrators and community listening as we speak. Uh, when I look at equity and attitude, okay, one of the bullets under that is I will accord others a respect. It says accord, in my mind, I read it as I will afford. I think it's pretty much the same term. I will accord others a respect I wish for myself. Um, I'm going to quote an article that was printed in the Valley Morning Star. The article was dated April 5th, 2022, and it was titled, San Benito Officials Scrap Cheerleader Tryout Scores, okay? It was quoted in there by one of our board members. It's unfortunate this situation has arisen. Uh, this is an operations issue. It's just Cervellon's second week on the job, and I'm sorry I'm mentioning name, but I'm quoting a, a newspaper article. It's just Cervellon's second week on the job, and this is how our district is being impacted with her as a leader. This is a no confidence vote on the interim and the school board. I want, to is, I want to issue the statement, and in my opinion, and it's factual information, this quote is one board member basically speaking for the board. I disagree, okay? This statement does, and, he, and, and, our, and again, each and every one of us has a, has a right to state our opinion, but the comment that is being made at this time is being made in my mind, and in my opinion, on a personnel issue, and that is not the way to handle personnel issues. Okay, I believe that personnel issues must be handled through appropriate channels or part of the evaluation process. In addition to this, board operating procedures clearly state that the board president and the superintendent are the official spokesperson for the district. Okay, 
and they're the official spokesperson of the board. Therefore, when making statements to the media, it should be noted that we as board members, if we're stating, making statements individually, that you are stating your opinion as a community member, and this goes for myself as well, ladies and gentlemen, okay, uh, unless I'm, I'm the spokesperson for the board, but any other board member that offers a comment or opinion, which they're welcome to do so, it should be stated, in my opinion, as an opinion and as a, communi as a community member and not as a spokesperson for the board. And again, I'm not, I, I don't deter you guys from, from commenting to, to, you know, we have, we have um, uh, reporters out there that, that you know, want to highlight uh, the positives in the district, but many times people don't buy newspapers when we're highlighting the, uh, the good things in the district. They buy the newspapers when they hear the bad, the ugly, okay? So once again, I'm just reminding uh, everyone here today as far as the board members that the, and if we're going to represent the board via media, the superintendent or interim su superintendent for that matter, and or the uh, board president are the official spokespersons for the board. Again, I reiterate, you're welcome to comment, but I, I feel that, that uh, any other board member should comment as a community member and not a board member. Okay, going back to that comment that was made. I also wanna make reference to Board policy BBE local in reference to the employee. And although I mentioned the name that was being basically in my mind spoken to derogatorily about, okay, there is BBB, no, I'm sorry, there is a, a board policy uh, BJCD. And once again, I reiterate any concerns on our superintendent or any employee for that matter, but especially our superintendent, we need to follow policy BJCD. In addition to that, there are uh, any comments, okay? We, re I, you know, I receive calls, and I'm going to go as far as I, I know, and I, I'm going to use you as, as an example, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Rudy Corona, because I know that we were on the trip. You received a, a, a concern from a parent, okay? I received board concerns uh, from a parent, and I'm sure we all have received board concerns from even community members, okay? It's okay in my mind, in my opinion, to receive those concerns, but there is also a board policy that I want to reference and remind everybody. It's board policy BBE local, which states that employee, parents, students, or other members of the public may bring concerns to any uh, one of us at any given time, but those concerns should be brought up to the superintendent's attention. Okay? What I don't like and, I, and, and again, I, I, have, I have evidence, okay, where, and at first, let me do the positive. Again, I'm going to refer to myself. I received a call about some possible, uh, I don't want to call it wrongdoings, but, but uh, things that were not handled correctly, okay? And so I immediately brought it up to our interim superintendent. On my flight, I received a text message from Mr. Corona letting me know that he had also received a concern from a community member slash parent. And I want to applaud him for following the protocol. He did let me know. And again, there was a matter, again, going back to the communication, there was a communication and a, a communication error on my part because I skimmed through his message. I didn't read the entire message. And I assumed based on my skimming that he was talking about what I already knew. However, he did follow protocol, and thank you for that, Mr. Corona, because you immediately said, I have forwarded this concern to Ms. Terrion, so thank you for following board policy. Okay? Um, other things, and, and, and I wasn't going to mention it, but I think it, it is important to mention. Uh, once again, miscommunications being placed out in the community via phone calls, via media. I'm going to state a, a couple of bullets, and these are truths. And these are truths that, can, that are documented and truths that have been uh, uh, quoted in, in newspapers, okay? And some of these I, I wanna, I'm, that I'm going to reference are, I'll start with this following statement. In the El Paso Times, dated February 21st, 22, this was a statement made by our former superintendent. The former superintendent stated, I was drawn to Socorro ISD based on their education and the fact that it's an innovative and highly successful school district. When the job came open, I was immediately drawn to it. Okay, 
Another quote from our former superintendent, board dynamics were not the primary reason that he sought out the Socorro Post. Once again, I was drawn to Socorro ISD based on their reputation as an innovative, highly successful school district. Once again, a fact. Another fact, the Socorro ISD Board of Trustees unanimously voted to offer a three-year contract with a starting pay of $335,000 to this gentleman. Compared to a base salary in San Benito CISD of $202,776. That's quite an increase. Yes, there's 50,000 students, but that's a big increase. So that to me would be very appetizing for any individual. Another fact, the superintendent, past superintendent past and superintendent in the future will continue to receive an evaluation with input from all seven board members. Whether or not we are of the opinion that we agree or we disagree with each other's uh, uh, information that we provide in that evaluation, the fact remains that all seven board members were afforded the opportunity to follow BJCD and complete the superintendent evaluation. Again, fact, everybody was able to contribute to that. Last fact that I want to state is that Texas Education Code Chapter 21 allows school board members as school board trustees to release a superintendent from an employment contract if a superintendent requests to be released upon a resignation. Our former superintendent did request to be released and we followed Texas Education Code Chapter 21 by affording him that opportunity. All facts, okay? Our San Benito CISD Board of Trustees voted 7-0 that's every single one of us, 7-0, accepted the superintendent's resignation at a regular board meeting held on Tuesday, March 8, 2022. Okay? What I don't agree with, and I think it needs to be pointed out to the public and to the administration and to us board members, is I do not agree with the day after, the day after, and again, this is an opinion, but a day after the superintendent was released from the contract, a petition goes out. Can any one of the seven board members here prevent a petition from going out? No, we can't. A petition can go out by any, can be requested and, and started by any individual, any community member, any time, and they can use any type of resource, any type of, so, any type of social media they so choose. But when we have a board member Okay, send out a text message to community members with their phone number stating San Benito CISD school board majority taking us backwards. Have all your family and friends sign it and that comes to the attention to the board. I think we have a problem. And once again, I think it's a communication issue and there's individuals that are acting on the behalf of the board and that's not what we're here to do. In addition to that, the statement read, a school board majority playing political games affecting our students and destabilizing our district once more. I take that personally, and in my opinion, uh, the seven members of this board have made great contributions to our district. We have all you administrators there before us right now. We have provided raises for everyone across the board. Okay, I'm going to recognize Dr. Ariel Cruz because in her profession, okay, she's more in the medicine, in the, in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, field. She was very worried when this pandemic hit and she made recommendations for the safety of our student and the board voted on the mask mandate. We as a board have also approved many, many different types of curriculum purchases that will enhance the instruction provided by our San Benito CISD teachers and hence promote student success. So when we have one member, again, no name mentioned, making comments like that, all I can ask is that we take a look at what we're stating, we take a look at who we're representing, 
and that we make a positive change and start working as a team of seven and or team of eight with our superintendent included for the success of our district. One last thing that I want to mention once again, and this is an opinion. In the Valley Morning Star edition of March 8, 2022, it is stated, what this petition shows is the discontent of staff and community on the board's actions since they were elected. And once again, one board member basically representing their opinion in my eyes but yet speaking for the community, speaking for the board, and that's where I go back and say my recommendation is that we follow practice and make those so-called attacks or so-called comments, but do it as an individual community member, not as a member of the board. Okay, and lastly, the last statement that was made is they, they micromanaged him making reference to our previous superintendent they limited his ability to work as a superintendent, and it's obvious that he didn't want to work under those conditions. Once again, folks, that's an opinion. An opinion that any individual is welcome to make, in my opinion, not as a board member. So with that said, I have a final statement and then I'll open it up for discussion. Community, Administrators, fellow board members, I have cited examples of conduct which I believe are contrary to the San Benito CISD board member code of ethics within board policy BBC local, in addition to the San Benito CISD board operating procedures. Once again, while I recognize that every individual in this room may exercise freedom of speech and may state their opinions and speak on the district's operations and performance as an individual citizen, it is my opinion that those negative comments provided to the news media on several occasions regarding the district, trustees, and at least one employee in this room have been unjustified and completely unprofessional. In addition, once again, in a recent media article, there is quotes making demoralizing comments concerning an employee of San Benito CISD. And once again, that employee is sitting to my left. She has been publicly attacked and not being afforded a fair chance. She's been here two weeks. That in itself, in my opinion, stating concerns to the board as required, but rather going to the media is not a constructive practice or in the best interest of the district. Once again, and last, I, and the last time I say it, if concerns exist about any district employee, they should be handled via appropriate channels as part of the evaluation process. So all that that has been stated, with everything I stated, I would like to make a motion and move that we, the members of the San Benito CISD Board of Trustees, make this statement to re-endorse and re-approve the board member code of ethics that we all took an oath on, and also the San Benito CISD board policy BBF local to work at all times in the best interest of the district and to promote and prioritize professionalism, unity, civility, and candor in all of our dealings and communications with other trustees, district employees, community members, and students. Let's work as a team of eight. Motion has been made. If I may, do I have a second? And then I will allow any further discussion. I'll second. Second. Okay, I have a motion made by myself, second by Mr. Medrano. Any discussion? I, that was a very passionate speech and I agree Thank with you. everything that you said. But in order to make a motion like that, would we need an actual policy? Update. A policy update? No, I don't think so. Because, because it's a, it's like the policy is there. No, no, but you're, were you adding words? To no, it I'm at not. The end? No, I'm not. I'm just. I'm, my motion is as a team of eight, as a team of seven, that we continue to basically state that we are going to reendorse what we already signed an oath for, that we are going to follow 
board policy BBF local, and that we're going to adhere to our board member code of ethics and our board operating, op operating procedures. BBF local? The board policy that I'm quoting is BBF local. Yes, ma'am. I've had a lot of concerns too. I get a lot of phone calls and I've gotten from the media and I learned in leadership TASB, when you get a call from the media or the paper or anybody, I'm, I'm not one board member. The superintendent, the uh, interim superintendent or the president is in charge of all the board. You know, if I speak, you know, I, I want to speak against the majority or the minority, it doesn't matter. He, is, he, he or she is responsible of talking to the media. That's what I learned in leadership testing. Yeah. Mr. Moreno, I just wanted to make sure, so you weren't, it, you're just reaffirming everything here. You're not adding the part about I'm the- I'm not adding anything to what's already in place. I'm just, re, I'm just asking that we as a board reaffirm that we will comply with what we're supposed to be complying with. Okay, that's my bad. I thought you were gonna add the part no, about the candor no. and everything like that. I appreciate the question, no, but we're not. Mr. Moreno, I appreciate everything you read out right now. Yes, sir. And I am 100% agreement with you. I ask that the board also respect each other's homes. Going and filming someone's home is very unprofessional. Posting it on social media and trying to discredit someone because you have a gathering is totally wrong. I agree. Those things, we all, I'm sorry, someone said something. So I think we can work as a team of eight if we continue moving forward and respecting each other's spaces. Thank you for that, Mr. Corona. Thank you. Any further comments? Mr. Corona, I don't know if, you're, if you know specifically if, uh, a board member that has done that, but to my knowledge, no, no board members have done that before. And so I just want to make that clear that none of us, myself at least, I've never done that. So I just wanted to clear that out. Ms. Lopez, um, if, you, if you'd like, I can show you the film. I don't need to see the film. I saw the no. film. Oh, you, you, you I saw the it. film. So you I'm are just aware saying, I don't know if you have any evidence or factual information to know that a board member actually recorded that. Exactly. You but, know, but as but far as that's what I'm board saying. members, that's I myself never recorded anything, so I just wanted to clear No, that that's why I'm making the public. statement, because I do have it on film. I sure. have it on my film. Okay. All right. And um, so I do have a comment to make. Um, I have some information here that I wanted to go over. Um, you know, thank you, Mr. Moreno, for bringing this up. And I think it was very important for us to be able to protect our district and the image of the district as well. And from the information that Mr. Moreno uh, presented, I wanted to also provide some of the board ethics that I feel that we need to all keep in mind. And one of them is I will accord others the respect I wish for myself. I will be accountable to the public by representing representing district policies, programs, priorities, and progress accurately. I will tell the truth. I will respect the majority decision as a decision of the board. I will base my decisions on fact rather than supposition, opinion, or public favor. I will refuse to surrender judgment to any individual or group at the expense of the district as a whole. I will consistently uphold all applicable laws, rules, policies, and governance procedures. I will avoid personal involvement in activities the board has delegated to the superintendent, and I will be continuously guided by what is best for the students of the district. And that's why we are not supposed to micromanage, because it does say we have to let the superintendent do her job as she needs to do. Um, those are all from BBF policy here. And I also want to read or, um, bring this out to the public also. When we vote as a board, we use something called Robert's Rules. And it's, it's an, a way of doing things. It's a form of par parliamentary procedure. And in a dem democratic school board, the majority rules, right? We have seven people, four or more vote, and that will rule. Okay, so it's understandable and commendable that we will not always agree as a board, and it's your right to express that free speech or that free democracy that we do have. We all have the right to express our opinion, and I, of course, encourage for us to have differences of opinions because we learn from each other, and we're in the end, we come together and we make a decision. We take a vote. Um, as well, we have to have an open mind for other people's ideas, right? But when we go to the media and we shame board members or we shame employees, 
that is undermining the SBCISD board and parliamentary procedure that we have in place. And to close this off, being an elected official does not make leadership. Leaders who seek power, control, and popularity will eventually lose it all. It is incumbent on all the board trustees to remind ourselves of our role as civil servants. We are here to serve. And we are here to work hard together to promote unity and reverence, not division and failure. Unity that we exhibit within the walls of this room and continue as we walk out that door. We as the SBCISD school board, along with our interim superintendent, should be concerned with the entire school district as the big picture in promoting leadership. So I, I implore everybody, let's stay united, let's stay focused, let's do what is right for our district no matter what, with the end in mind of making sure that our kids are successful. Thank you very much. Okay. In addition to that, um, I think something that we need to keep abreast of when it comes to board member ethics is as board members, we sit up here and we represent the school district yes, sir. and out there in the public, we're also representing the school district. And I wanna make note that we shouldn't be attacking anybody from the community on social media. Cause I know as a, as a board member sitting here, I was attacked on social media when a post on somebody's personal Facebook came out that said, school board candidates should live in the city of the district they are running for. The initials doctor refers to a medical doctor. Is she a medical doctor? Is this woman, Ariel Cruz, being truthful to the San Mito residents? Look at the pictures to find out who is supporting this candidate. You be the judge. And then goes on to spread misinformation about a community member at that time. I believe that that isn't correct board member ethics as well. And once again, I, will, I wouldn't know who that board member was, and I don't think, unless you do, you want to disclose that, it wouldn't be important. But, I don't but, think, but, yeah, I don't think it's important. But, I just but think it, is as a, it is a very critical statement. In order to, from, to move forward, to move, continue moving forward, once again, we need to work as a team of eight. Yeah, as board members, we need to support our community exactly. members and support our students. Exactly, 100% agree. So with that said, we do have uh, a motion on the board uh, presented by myself, uh, seconded by Oscar Medrano. Are there any other further comments? If not, I ask for a board vote. No comments? Okay. Uh, may I have by a show of hands if we agree that we will follow what's in place for board members to follow by a raise of your hand. Okay. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you. Okay. Next item on our agenda is closed meeting in accordance with Texas Government Code Open Meetings Act. The board may move into closed session for the following reasons. Section 551.071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney <coughs> on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law. Section 551.074, for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, or to hear complaints or charges against a public officer or employee, and section 551.082, certain school board deliberations. It is 821, I, we move into executive session. Boom. All right, the time is 9.59 and I call this meeting back to order. Okay, first and foremost, we want to uh, bring in item 5.5 that we brought in from the consent agenda item. Re, uh, request approval of proposals for RFP 1221 Professional Consultant Services. Ms. Cedrion? Yes, sir. Uh, I recommend that we include uh, Mark White on our approved vendors list. Okay, do I have a motion to uh, accept the... Uh, list as stated. The list as stated in closed session. Motion. Okay, we have a motion by, by Ariel Cruz. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, second by Rudy Corona. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Okay, moving on to uh, employment, resignations, retirements, and terminations. Ms. Cervellon? Yes, sir. I also uh, request the board accept as discussed in closed session. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. 
Okay, I have a motion by second. Mario Silva, second by Oscar Medrano, to accept the resignations, retirements, and ter terminations as presented in executive session. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries, 6-0. Okay, item 9.5, discussion, consideration, and possible action to re-employ probationary contract employees to include teachers, librarians, counselors, and nurses for the 2022-2023 school year. So moved. Ms. Cervellon. Okay, I also request that the board approve and accept uh, item 9.5. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Ms. Janie Lopez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Oscar Medrano. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6 0. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. I believe there were a different, is there a different class of counselors, uh, uh, Dr. Cruz? Because when we had, we, uh, we approved last month, we approved administrators, counselors. So are there, is there a different class of counselors? So should counselors not be on that? On this list? Uh -huh. They should have been on the last one. Is there a counselor? They, they weren't on the last one. What's they the agenda item? The agenda item is 9.6, and it states discussion, consideration, and possible action to renew term contract employees to include teachers, librarians, counselors, and nurses for the 22-23 oh. school year. And at the, at the previous uh, regular board meeting, we approved administrator contracts, and counselors were included in that list of uh, administrative contracts. Correct. Is that correct? So do we, so we do need to remove that, Mr. Weller? If it's already been approved um, and it's already occurred, then you don't need to do it again. But is there a problem with us having listed it on there any, I mean, just verbally stating it? No. It's okay. So we can, the motion carries as read. The agenda item does not control the content. The, Thank you, the sir. The content controls the content. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. And... 9.7 was just item 9.7 was just for discussion and consideration so no action needed on that so at this point if there are no uh, further questions do i have a motion to adjourn so move second. we have a motion by oscar medrano second 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 by rudy corona all those in favor raise your right hand motion carries six zero a meeting adjourned 1003. Okay, I'm go we're, it's 10.04 and I'm uh, going to open this meeting uh, of the Board of Trustees today. Once again, is Tuesday, April 12th. There was an agenda item that uh, was not uh, uh, discussed and or approved, is item 9.6. So uh, opening that back up, it is discussion, consideration, and possible action to renew term contract employees to include teachers, librarians, and nurses for the 2022-2023 school year. So move. Okay, a motion by Oscar Medrano, second. Second. Second by Rudy Corona. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries, 6 0. Okay, now there is no further items to discuss. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Oscar Medrano, the second. Second. Second by Rudy Corona. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries, 6 0. Time is now 10 05. Meeting adjourned.